It's um, 12 noon here on the, uh, on the West Coast and 3 p.m. Eastern, which would make it 4.30 Newfoundland time, but I don't think anyone's joining us from The Rock today. But um, mm -hmm. So thank you, everyone. This is our, our monthly uh, session for the NDSA Infrastructure Interest Group, and the, uh, the theme today is uh, collaborating with IT, and we have a couple of, I won't say speakers, more like people that are hopefully going to help us think through some of the issues through just a really informal conversation. I have some questions prepared and stuff like that, but I'd like this to flow as kind of naturally as as possible. So um, Nathan, I know um, as co-chair, feel free to, you know, to, um, to jump in with questions or, or directions you'd like to take the conversation as well. Um, and for those folks that are on, on the call, uh, feel free to unmute um, at a appropriate times or use the chat and we'll echo out those questions to, uh, to the folks that are joining us. Um, yeah, so um, I'll, I'll start by just some really brief introductions. Um, so, and, and, and Chip, my apologies for get, getting the, uh, some of your affiliation information wrong. So I think what I'll just Not say, at all. It's not a problem. <laughs> okay. It's, it's uh, clueless Canadians, as I say. It's, it's, uh, um, so yeah, so Chip, um, Chip German is the, the program director at uh, AP Trust with over three decades of uh, of leadership experience, both um, on the information technology sort of side of the shop, but also in libraries. And I think that's why, um, why Chip, I, we, we're really interested in your perspectives. Very, you know, there's, there's a number of folks out there, but it is actually relatively rare to have people that have a real experience on both sides of the shop. So um, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, we're also joined by Scott uh, Pratter. Uh, Scott, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Uh, actually, it's Prater. Long Prater. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, and Scott is a digital library uh, analyst at uh, University of Wisconsin Madison Libraries. And uh, and the reason, um, uh, well, Scott's very involved with a, a lot of stuff going on at the NDSA, but he's also recently published an article in the Journal of archival organization entitled How to Talk to IT About Digital Preservation, which is exactly the, uh, the theme of this call. So I'd just like to again thank both of you for, for joining us and, and sharing your experiences. Thanks. So I think what we'll do is just sort of have kind of an informal sort of interview style conversation for the first 30, 40 minutes. Again, folks feel free to jump in and then we can open it up to sort of a broader conversation. And I think what I'll do is just sort of start out, Chip, I was going to start with you. And I, it, in your experience sort of on both sides of, of the shop, as I call it, um, what, in your experience, generally speaking, when it comes to digital preservation, when it comes to librarians and archivists having conversations with uh, the IT folks, what, where do things go well and where do they tend to get hung up and where do the miscommunications tend to happen? Well, I'll, I'll start by uh, referring to, to Scott's article, which I think absolutely nails uh, most of the scenarios that I think of in my experience. Uh, you know, mostly it has to do with the fact that uh, each party to the conversation comes in with a different frame of reference. And, uh, uh, you know, from the IT side, that gets... Uh, complicated as well as on the uh, library side, but on the IT side, it gets complicated by the specific role that the person has. Uh, if it is, as in uh, Scott's descriptions, uh, uh, most of the folks are involved in, uh, in a range of infrastructure for which this kind of use is a, uh, you know, is not the, uh, the total focus by a long shot uh, as, uh, most of the folks are, uh, who are working, at, uh, certainly in central IT, are uh, thinking about um, access-related services, and uh, most of the time we're not talking about access. So, so I, I think that uh, it, you know it's that uh, uh, disjointed or, or uh, uh, poor match between the uh, the frames of reference. 
Uh, we can go uh, deeper on some other things later in the conversation, but I'll just sketch uh, one of the particular pieces that I've seen over the years. And that is uh, what we're thinking about from a, uh, from a preservation perspective with the materials that we're trying to uh, safeguard over the long term uh, is anything but commodity. It's all driven by our specific uh, kinds of material that we're, uh, uh, we're trying to protect. And a lot of our considerations have to do with, you know, things like formats and uh, metadata uh, that's unique to the material. And uh, from the central IT, I'm, I'm going to draw the distinction here between central IT and library IT. I think that's a significant difference for the institutions that have both. But from the central IT perspective, uh, this sounds, as Scott said, quite eloquently, uh, sounds like backup. And, uh, and that's a uh, completely different challenge for the uh, central IT folks than, uh, than what we're trying to do is for us uh, on the preservation side. So I'll stop there and let you dive deeper in whatever direction you want to go, Corey. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, Chip. And and sort of turning it over to you, to you Scott, and, and reflecting on, on Chip's comments, was there sort of a particular circumstance at your organization that led to the led to the article? Has it been something you've been thinking about for a long time? Just trying to get a sense of um, what led to uh, led to the publication. Yeah, actually, um, sort of. It came out of uh, BTAA, uh, Big Ten Academic Alliance. Uh, preservation meeting we had where Dan Noonan at OSU, you know, said he was going to be taking over a monthly feature and asked for, um, you know, from anybody in the digital preservation working group, uh, if they wanted to contribute. And I uh, volunteered because this was a topic I had been thinking about for quite a while. I actually started off as a systems administrator, um, in libraries and then through my career worked uh, you know through software developer and through um uh through project manager and kind of wound up where i am now so i've sort of i've had a chance in the course of my career to be on all sides of the table really and um i'm pretty fortunate in our um in our organization to have really good working relationships with our library IT and with central IT. Um, but I do know that, you know, over the course of the past several years, as we start talking about digital preservation, there was always kind of a hang up there, especially talking with uh, central IT that, you know, Chip commented on that they're focused on making sure that things are running right now and um, business continuity. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought that, you know, IT in general is focused pretty much on the future and new services and new needs and, you know, kind of the next best thing and making things easier into the future. And backups, even though very important, a part of that is mainly just about disaster recovery and getting things back up to speed right now so you're you're at where you were yesterday and nobody had really thought about all these different aspects of digital preservation um i you know i'd like to say that all the the entire article sprung out of my own head fully formed but that's not true that i actually it's the fruit of a lot of conversations i've had with a lot of people and one of them is um the uh IT manager, the system administrator here at our library. And, you know, we kind of had a lot of the discussions that I talked about in the uh, article. And as I started sort of being a bridge between uh, archivists and uh, digital preservation uh, specialists and librarians and central IT, I realized we we're kind of having the same confusions and the same, uh, the same discussions you know, over and over again. And that usually it would take at least three or four meetings of things were going well before everybody understood what everybody else was saying. So I, I really just kind of want to um, uh, repeat what uh, Chip said, that mostly it was a translation of frame of reference. The only other thing I'll add to that is um, I think that you know, what I hear from a lot of archivists when I'm out in the world is that, well, I don't understand what central IT is doing. And 
there's sort of this idea that, you know, central IT systems administrator have all the knowledge they need. It's basically incumbent upon archivists to understand what central IT is telling them. I mean, there's this very kind of um, sort of subservient perspective. I, I see a lot of times when I'm talking with archivists and what was really illuminating talking with system administrators too is that the conversation needs to go both ways. That there are lots and lots of things about digital preservation that archivists know and understand that simply haven't made it into system administration community yet. And that the education is not only explaining how SANS and network array storage and all that stuff works, but also explaining to uh, system administrators what digital preservation is, why it's important, what kind of activities go around it, and why it's different than backup. I mean, backup is definitely a kind of fundamental part of it, but that's not all it is. So one of, one of the things I hope to accomplish with the article was to get across to archivists that not only you know, do archivists have a lot to learn about IT in these conversations, but IT have a lot to learn uh, from you in these conversations also. Well, it's really sort of interesting, the different, um, the different intersections at the different levels within an organization. And I'm just wondering, Chip, in your experience, is it, how critical is it that the, the dean of libraries or the, or the director and the CIO have a relationship and are able to communicate about these, these bigger issues? Yeah, if, uh, Corey, the question actually is a really uh, interesting one on multiple levels. So the first and uh, most important is, I, I think that, uh, you know, in terms of things like capacity planning, in terms of financial modeling for how stuff is paid for, if you're, if you're looking at a central IT service that's managed separately from, uh, uh, from the library, uh, as it is in most of the institutions, the, uh, the, the notion of having a good, at least communication channel between those two, and also some sense that each of them has some understanding of what's happening in the other person's shop, uh, uh, strikes me as uh, critically important. Uh, you know, the other piece about this is uh, uh, is something that's a little hobby horse for me that I've, uh, I've been working on for a lot of years. So uh, just so everybody understands the background that I bring into this, I worked for, uh, I'm, I'm old as dirt, so let me start there. And then uh, uh, I worked for nine years uh, as the uh, the uh, chief planning and uh, policy officer for central IT at the University of Virginia, uh, and and that put me in uh, the circumstances of dealing with uh, connecting the IT organization's overall strategic planning with data center capacity planning uh, at a high level. Uh, it wasn't down in the, into the uh, technical details uh, so much as uh, at a kind of high level. Uh, but also developing policies on such th uh, things as disaster recovery. And this, uh, this is a crossover point between the two perspectives, and that is the sequence with which uh, services get restored when there are outages, those, those kinds of things are, uh, are quick points where uh, the uh, chief officer of the library and the chief officer of IT need to have really good communication going on and let that uh, model that down through the organization. But, um, but the other thing is, again, this, uh, this interesting distinction between library, uh, IT organizations within libraries uh, at you know, the major institutions, uh, certainly the ones that I've uh, had experience with even in the uh, uh, intermediate sized institutions that I've uh, dealt with to sort of finish the background uh, piece. I went from uh, UVA in that role of, I was the first vice president at a, a, the smaller school, the University of Mary Washington that dealt with both libraries and IT. The organizations were separate, but I had responsibility for both of them. And I uh, worked there for six years and then went to Millersville University in Pennsylvania, another uh, intermediate level uh, institution uh, with a similar kind of structure and then came back to UVA and among the things that I'm uh, doing, I've been dealing with uh, AP Trust for the last uh, five years. 
so anyway, in thinking about that, I've got a, a, a set of models to uh, uh, be familiar with, but the particular one that I think is uh, something that uh, uh, that Scott and I have both touched on is this distinction between uh, IT specialists within the library and then central IT. And um, going beyond the question of how those, uh, the leaders of the two organizations uh, uh, deal with each other, the relationship between library IT and central IT is also a critical factor in the nature of the conversations. So for example, if library IT has enough autonomy to be able to operate its own infrastructure, then your conversation is very different than if you're a person uh, uh, professionally focused on uh, preservation and talking to uh, central IT. And you may have to, in an organization that has both, talk to both library IT and uh, central IT, or at least uh, enlist the aid of library IT in negotiating the uh, the results that you want from central IT. So it gets, gets complicated and layered uh, that we have a great advantage here at UVA of uh, having uh, folks uh, like Scott who've, uh, who have experience in both, uh, both camps in library IT. Uh, so that makes that conversation a lot easier. So has it, has the sort of the move to sort of instant provisioning of, of infrastructure through Amazon and other, right. has that changed the conversation? Has that empowered libraries and archives within larger institutions that might not have the capacity to do yeah. the sort of things that, yeah. I, I certainly think so. And I don't, I'm, I'm not going to hog this answer. I want to make sure Scott has a chance to weigh in on that because I'm sure uh, uh, he has experience along these lines too. But the, my sense of it is, and again, being, uh, at this for a long time. Uh, I've been anticipating for a number of years that uh, university data centers would, uh, would face financial pressures that force them to look at where they actually add significant unique value to institutions and where they don't, where they're providing a commodity service that could uh, uh, just as easily and sometimes more cheaply be provided by uh, other uh, commercial service providers. Uh, that also changes the nature of the conversation in this layered effect that I was uh, describing. So, for example, at the University of Virginia, the library IT folks have their own presence in, uh, in AWS. So does uh, uh, central IT. But as you can imagine, it makes a whole lot more sense that if you're working on a preservation project, you can talk to your own library IT folks. They already know something about the business that you're doing, and they also have the expertise to configure uh, and do the dynamic kind of provisioning that you just described. Uh, uh, that makes for a really great, very direct line of decision making and design that uh, you're uh, it kind of blurs the, the distinction between the service provider and the uh, and the customer because, in this case, uh, with those with that kind of provisioning that you can do by selecting, you know, uh, items on a menu on the screen, uh, it makes you much more a participant in the design of the uh, environment that you're uh, you're able to build, and I I think that's a positive thing. The more direct. Uh, the involvement of the preservation specialist with the uh, library configuration specialist that can manipulate that environment can work pretty well. Scott, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I pretty much agree. In fact, um, you know, the scenario uh, Chip just described where, you know, we have um, University of Wisconsin, Madison has an AWS account that's centrally managed. The library has an account within that. And I worked with one of our system administrators here, you know, a few months ago to start um, putting our things in Glacier. And that went really rather quickly and smoothly, a lot more quickly and smoothly than I thought it would go. I would say, though, I mean, kind of one caveat I have to that is um, I still think it's kind of incumbent upon uh, digital archivists and, you know, preservation librarians to understand the pluses and minuses or the pros and cons and limitations and benefits of the platform that you're putting it on. Because 
I mean, it's one thing for a sysadmin to come and say, okay, I put all your stuff in Glacier and now it's preserved. Well, no. <laughs> what it is is I have a copy of things stored on Glacier, but that's not the complete gamut and full range of, you know, what constitutes a good, strong digital preservation. And there are a number of things in the fine print of Amazon, for example, that you read and you look at and you go, oh my God, that's not, um, you know, I, I didn't realize that or that, uh, that, that doesn't really kind of go into digital preservation as I think of it. For example, you know, for uh, track auditing purposes, for example, we would need to know whenever something got corrupted and what, um, you know, when we ran fixity checks and be able to demonstrate that we're doing that and that when things are corrupted, they are uh, corrected and that we can prove to it and we can say these are the actions. If you're putting things in Amazon, they take all that, they take care of all that for you as far as we know and you're not going to get any insights into that. And so if auditing, for example, is uh, one of the requirements of your digital preservation system, then Amazon Web Services are not necessarily, or Glacier Storage is not necessarily going to get that for you. So I think that even though it makes it a lot easier to kind of set up a technical infrastructure, there's still quite a bit of work incumbent upon both the IT people and the, um, and the digital uh, preservation people to know how that system works and to be able to answer fairly detailed questions about it and understand to what extent it contributes to the digital preservation implementation and where it has gaps that not, might need to be filled in elsewhere. Yeah, Corey, uh, uh, real quickly, I completely agree with uh, Scott. That's exactly what I, what I mean by partnership design. Uh, rather than uh, just simply being a customer and waiting for the for the entity that you're uh, depositing to to just tell you what they can provide, I'm, uh, it's about doing exactly what Corey said: being active uh, on the on the design of uh, how that how that system delivers what it is that you're looking for. So I want to jump in here. Um and ask uh, both uh, Corey Scott and, and as well as others on, um, on the call, um, you know, what if this is, you know, your, your, your IT person, a specialist, your, this is the way you wanna work, let's say, you want to design, you want to partner and collaborate on, on the infrastructure um, choices, or it could be a, a different issue perhaps, but your, they don't, um, let's say, you know, they're used to a much more of that uh, client customer uh, type of model and uh, the more sort of collaborative um, uh, rela relationship uh, approach um, is sort of uh, unusual or different or not something that they want to go with. So. How can you help them get there? Wow, that's a good one. <laughs> and that, yeah, that's kind of, you know, might, uh, might be a whole nother topic for another article. Um, I think a lot of it depends on sort of your institutional, um, you know, culture and organizational uh, framework. You know, a lot of the things that uh, Chip, you know, has experience in, um, I know, for in our case, for example, you know, I'm working a lot with smaller campuses within the University of Wisconsin system, and they are sorely overstretched in terms of what their IT, central IT um, departments can provide. And they're just barely, you know, trying to keep their head above water and a lot of times not even um, managing to keep up with that. And so, you know, not for any, you know, uh, bad reasons, they're very, very reluctant to engage in new and different activities that might take resources away from just, you know, their kind of core mission, which is to keep the IT infrastructure running smoothly for the campus. Um, so what I've seen kind of work at other places is first, if you can get it buy-in is that this is a strategic direction 
that we need to go from both the library directors and IT directors where they're at the table kind of talking about is this worthwhile, is it not? If you can get that buy-in, you know, that's tremendous because then once you say, yes, I agree, this is important, then you can start having the negotiations about how to, um, you know, how to go about implementing it. Then once you kind of get down in the level of the trenches where you're actually making decisions, the approach that I've found works really well is, um, you know, systems administrators, uh, developers, technologists, what they like to do is they like to solve problems and they like to solve new problems and they like to get something juicy and work on it. So if you present it to them, not as kind of a customer demanding a service, but here's this interesting thing that we'd like to do and these problems we'd like to solve and can you help us solve them? And then boy, they get really excited. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> It's crafty. <laughs> so, you know, uh, thinking about Nathan's uh, uh, question, Nathan and I have a lot of experience on this uh, question, talking about it together in the AP Trust uh, context. And I think that one of the uh, uh, one of the points that it illustrates is that um, there are functions of scale involved here, uh, and uh, so I was, you know, those of us who are working on uh, preservation consortia uh, are trying to get to that kind of relationship on a regular basis. And the thing that uh, uh, sometimes complicates that is when you're working in a consortial context, uh, that you have different folks involved who have different perspectives of what they would like to see delivered as the, uh, the service. So there's that angle. The other uh, side of the uh, point, I think, is exactly what uh, uh, Scott said, and, and that is if you're, uh, uh, in any case, you get the IT uh, folks all charged up when you uh, come to them, not with the, here are the 20 things I need in, in technical specifications, but here's the problem I'm trying to, trying to solve and how can we work together to uh, uh, make this cool thing. It's always gonna work. So here's, uh, Nathan, do you have anything you would like to? <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't, I don't have any, any answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just uh, uh, trying to, read the chat here. Now, uh, I believe it was Michelle that basically said, um, let me see if I can go back to the chat. Michelle, are you, are you there? Are you able to? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Do you, do you want to sort of add, um, uh, talk about your chat there? Yeah, I think it helps often. Um, I don't know, sometimes when we talk to Central IT, who does the provisioning for our storage in general, um, I have to remind them that library assets are not actually the same thing as a, all of the general data that offices produce. You know, they have a tendency to look at all of the storage as the same. And when we're trying to, you know, exercise preservation oversight and control and over certain assets, it, it, they really do require a different level of scrutiny. It's um, so, for instance, when you move a whole bunch of data or bits from one share to another because you're doing some kind of <clears throat> essential migration on the back end, uh, if those are actually library assets, we need to think in terms of the transparency of whether we can verify that that uh, transition has been successful. And, you know, if this is just average data that's generated out of an office, somebody's going to open up a couple of files and look at the tree structure and they're going to go, yeah, it looks like it's all there. And the sizes are basically a match. So that's great. Okay, we're done. But that's not the way we deal with verification in preservation, right? Like when we do verification in preservation, we are looking at an absolute one-to-one um, -one correspondence of attendance of files. So we want all of the files that were there before to be there afterwards. We want their sizes to be the same. We want their checksums to be the same. And we want to do that in an automated fashion that's very rigorous and complete. Um, and, and it's interesting because when, when you can get through and actually, you know, sort of slow the conversation down and say, you know, this is, 
these are actually different sorts of things than the types of things you're used to migrating every day. These are cultural artifacts or these are objects of research study. I think it's easier to get an ear and, and get some sympathy from central IT and get them to understand, oh, these are special or whatever. These are different and we need to actually engage different processes to do a good job with them. I, I think that's an excellent point. The, the, uh, the thing, uh, two things, Michelle, that puts in my mind. One of them is something, uh, both of them, I don't think uh, uh, Scott and I have highlighted uh, in, so far in the conversation, but one of them is, yeah, on, to put your point on steroids, uh, you know, in a public institution, uh, uh, under records retention requirements, a lot of the time, central IT is oriented toward not preserving forever, but uh, a schedule on which stuff is deleted and, and removed. And so it's a 100% you know, different kind of perspective than what we're talking about. So highlighting the difference in the nature of it is, uh, uh, you know, is something that we ought to assume we have to do in every, every one of those cases, because they may have just walked out of a meeting with the university records office so was saying, I want you to kill all email over you know, 90 days old. And, and one thing that I've kind of done to help focus on sort of the very different nature of the data, or even if it is like an Excel spreadsheet or something, you know, I'll talk about, you know what, we need this to be readable and accessible 100 years from now. And just putting that date flat out on the table 100 years from now, where, you know, in internet time, five years is a century, that really makes people's ears perk up. And then they start to wonder, well, what do you mean 100? We can't plan 100 year in advance, but it, it's a conversation starter. Yeah, and Scott, you know, the other thing uh, is the uh, uh, is research data. Uh, this is a real, again, blurring uh, issue because uh, we talked about central IT, library IT, at a lot of our research institutions, there's also a research infrastructure uh, component. And the library may have a, a, a significant interest in, uh, along with the researchers in the preservation of the research data. It's not exactly the same kind of uh, uh, question, but it does uh, mean that uh, we're asking our IT folks to understand a lot of distinctions that they prefer to just think of this as another set of, uh, of uh, ones and zeros, so uh, uh, can't, can't we all deal with it all the same way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we actually are running into that in our own institution as we're beginning to explore now uh, managing and preserving research data where the scales and kind of data are just so different than where we're used to even working within a library realm. You know, we have genetics uh, research data sets that, you know, they generate a terabyte a minute. It's like, well, whew. You know, we're not used to dealing with library data even on that kind of scale. So there's some education going on here within our own walls too. Well, this is um, a, you know, a really interesting turn in the conversation for, uh, for me and within the Canadian context, I think what we're finding is a lot of the developments around digital research infrastructure um, sort of writ large nationally is where we've been able to really making that connection between preservation and infrastructure that needs to be in place over the long term and that needs to scale and that someone needs to pay for is a really critical part of the uh, the overall sort of innovation agenda for the government of Canada. But what you know, one of the things I'm kind of wondering is, and I I know the sunsetting of um, of DPEN happened for. A bunch of different reasons, and I'm certainly not privy to any of the um, uh, sort of the um, the inner workings of the organization. But in some of the publications afterwards, one of the issues that came up was this idea that um, you know the, the distinction between digital preservation and cloud storage um, wasn't necessarily. It, 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 it was challenging to make the case for infrastructure like DPEN because technical people saw solutions in things like Glacier or other sort of cloud storage infrastructure. Is that accurate? Is that an issue that we need to address? Well, I can, I can certainly 
uh, I think it's what you described is a, uh, a, a significant factor and it, multiple ways to get at the point. Um, it's not, you. obviously it's not unique to Deepin. Obviously it's not unique to uh, consortia versus individual institution approaches to this, uh, uh, to this question either. Uh, and it is a, a variant of what I think uh, uh, Scott uh, laid out so well, and that is the, uh, the, the looking at the problem, uh, I've forgotten the phrase uh, correctly, but uh, the, uh, how to say the phrase correctly, but it's like uh, 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 IT folks looking at the problem because they're carrying a hammer as a nail. Uh, there is a, a lot of uh, difference between, um, so let me, let me go back a step and say, that. that sounds to me like a variant of the backup argument. Uh, it's just that the backup medium happens to be cloud-based uh, uh, storage. It's, it, it's blind to the many other factors uh, that we all understand to be part of a, a comprehensive preservation program. And um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Scott because he did such a nice uh, job of outlining where some of those questions come up and what that distinction is. Yeah, and so, um, you know, mainly the way that we've kind of been approaching it here and the argument that I've been making is that, you know, cloud storage can be part of a, um, digital preservation program, but is not the same as a digital preservation uh, program. It, you know, it can be a necessary part, but not, a, you know, it's not sufficient in and of itself. And um, I don't think they're, you know, Deepin definitely went further down that route towards, uh, uh, you know, trying to be a full-blown preservation platform. But even that, I think, you know, it's, it, wa it wasn't enough to put something in Deepin and say that you're preserving your things for all time. That, that Deepin was not a preservation program. It was basically a cloud storage provider that was oriented towards answering some of the requirements and tasks that we have as digital uh, preservation professionals. I don't know about the experiences uh, others have had, but from our own experience, it it ended up making more sense to make AWS one of our cloud storage providers, Glacier, as part of a piece of our overall um, digital preservation infrastructure, than to you know pay more money for Deepin for value added that we had to roll out and do, you know, tasks and things that we had to roll out and do for other providers anyways. So it, you know, kind of ended up sort of sadly being that uh, Deepin uh, was kind of right there in the sweet spot of um, giving us what we really didn't uh, need, but not giving us what we absolutely did need. Unfortunately, I think what every institution does need is to have their own in-house digital preservation program and um, implementation that can make use of these other services in a, uh, you know, in an integrated kind of intelligent way. I completely agree with uh, uh, Scott on that. It's if all of these solutions are not the program, they're, uh, they're components. I completely agree. Uh, just one quick comment about Deepin. Uh, Deepin was only partially uh, commercial cloud, uh, yet we were, uh, AP Trust was one of the nodes, uh, uh, Chronopolis, uh, uh, which did not have commercial cloud components, was, uh, uh, was another uh, Texas Digital Library, uh, uh, again, has used the Texas uh, uh, Supercomputing Center as a um, as a uh, location for its storage. So I think that uh, the component with Deepin, exactly as Scott uh, said, uh, uh, fixity checking uh, operated differently in the Deepin environment. Um, 
We're AP Trust is cloud storage. We do independent fixity checking on our materials and don't depend on uh, Amazon's built-in uh, fixity uh, for that kind of stuff. So it, it, exactly, it's you know you need to look at them as components and figure out how they fit uh, uh, an institution-specific uh, digital preservation program. Well, thank you very much. I know, um, David, you um, have a comment in the chat there. Would you like to expand on that? Um, I'll just give you a moment if you'd like to. Don't feel obliged. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I'd be happy to. I, you know, I, I think the, the comments by Chip and by Scott are, are right on that, um, you know, one of the problems with Deepin was really, I guess, articulating the value proposition, especially at the campus level. And, you know, there was a lack of flexibility in the service. There, there are a lot of problems and, um, you know, some of that will come out in our final report, uh, which uh, should be published by the end of this week. However, you know, some of the things we were looking at, and certainly I'm still on the NDSA uh, cloud fixity uh, group and, and trying to, you know, follow through on some of these groups because it's really difficult, I think, at a campus level for, say, library IT staff to, um, to articulate to uh, not only campus IT, but maybe even up at the provost level or, or uh, you know, whatever the funding chain is, that a more expensive service than what IT is currently providing needs to be included. Uh, you know, cloud is part of the solution, on-campus archiving is part of the solution, uh, but both as Chip and Scott have said that, uh, you know, it, it's, it encompasses more than that. And one of the big issues is how do you track all that? Uh, we know that for long-term preservation, most of us won't be around when that data needs to be recovered. And so, you know, what's the process for doing that and how do we assure that we have good provenance on that data? Thanks so much, David. Yeah, I would just add to that real quickly that um, what I'm kind of seeing in general in the field is that there are no good sort of standard answers as to what's needed and what isn't. There isn't, you know, built up this kind of body of knowledge and practice like there is, for example, in the cataloging and storing of printed material and of books. And so we're still kind of in the infancy of, um, of the field and figuring out what we need to store, how we need to store it, what information is important and what isn't. And so in some respects, I kind of see Deepin was maybe a little bit too far ahead of its time in that it was offering a service for something that we really kind of collectively as a profession have not yet figured out. Well, that's an interesting perspective. Um, it, I'd like to, you know, just provide the opportunity for others to, to jump in here with questions or comments. I'll just um, a little bit of space for that, so please. It's always a fine balance. How long do you wait? And at what point does the silence become uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> it's what they invented Muzak for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, here, I'll jump in here with a, with another sort of comment in terms of um, what's the role of organizations like NDSA or, or larger groups in terms of helping practitioners, helping senior admin really articulate the value proposition here and, and to be able to have really constructive conversations with those, those folks on, on, on campuses at central IT departments that need to understand what we're doing. How as a community can we build capacity for our, for our, our members? Scott, maybe I'll, I'll start if you have any thoughts on, on that. Sure, I'm a relatively new um, acquisition um, from by NDSA, but uh, I, you know, I've been following the NDSA levels of preservation uh, almost since uh, when they came out, 
And that was really kind of nice in that it was groundbreaking, especially for people down at the level of implementation where they actually do this, to have a nice concrete set of guidelines that we could actually go to a developer or a sysadmin, a storage network person and say, we want to do this and we could point to that. And that was invaluable because there are lots and lots of articles written about, you know, strategy and don't forget this and don't forget that. And these are things you need to think about, but there's not really a lot written that says, here's a kind of step-by-step -step framework you can get and you can get someplace with it. Now, you know, we know that it all has its problems and its faults and, you know, we're now working on improving it for um, kind of current, uh, generation of storage. But at the time, and even now, it was just invaluable. It, and one of the things that was also invaluable about the levels of preservation is that it gave us a shared framework, a shared vocabulary to start talking about this in a way where we all understood each other, that you know, NDSA provided language. And what I really see a value in what NDSA is doing right now is that more than anything, it's kind of building up this common community of experts and professionals in the field um, that share um, practices, share language, share a perspective, a point of view, and even kind of implementation designs that we've all come onto. And that alone is extremely powerful in that we all go back to our institutions. We talk with our colleagues about this, we talk with our directors or we are directors ourselves. And overall, as a field, we begin to influence the, um, the course that digital preservation takes out there in the wider world as a uh, practice. And that to me is sort of why I feel like the real value of NDSA is just everybody talking together and agreeing, this is what we're gonna talk about. This is how we're gonna talk about it. These are the frameworks. These are the things that are important to us. Yeah, this is Chip. I, uh, again, agree completely. The only other uh, uh, thing that I would add that wouldn't be just straight up copying what Scott just said is uh, I continue to uh, invest all my faith in organizations like MDSA in solving the long tail uh, issues. I, you know, I am always deeply afraid that uh, if left to our own advice, uh, devices, our large institutions would solve uh, all the problems in their own context for themselves by their own idiosyncratic uh, methods. But um, I'm most worried uh, about digital cultural heritage from you know, small museums and historical societies and all of the other entities that generate uh, or uh, look after uh, some of this, uh, you know, some really important parts of this material that's just not in the mainstream of what uh, the larger entities are able to do. And I think it's organizations like NDSA that can help us keep that in mind and figure out strategies that work not only for the, the, the biggest players in the, uh, in the field, but uh, everybody. Thanks, Chip. Uh... Nathan, how you, how you doing? Any, any thoughts on the conversation so far? Um, I don't have anything to, uh, anything new to contribute uh, to the conversation, but I wonder if we should shift towards a few um, uh, business housekeeping details mm. okay. uh, in the final bit of the meeting here. Well, uh, but I don't yeah. want to shut anyone else down if there were other um, <laughs> other folks who wanted to chime in. I think that probably, yeah, that, I mean, that sounds like a good idea. We should probably address some of these. Nathan, would you mind leading that sort of part of the? Sure. Okay. And uh, so I guess just to, just to wrap up, uh, Chip and Scott, thanks so much for sharing your uh, perspectives on this really critical issue, not only that we tackle at the local campus level, but as a, as a community, it's uh, an issue that we're, we're constantly engaged in dealing with. So I really appreciate both of your perspectives and, and thank you very much. You would hear a round of applause were we in the same room right now. But, uh, really appreciate your time. Happy to do it. Thanks. Thanks very yeah. much for the opportunity.
Yeah, thank you. That was really nice. Yeah, thanks. And Nathan, if you don't mind, I'll turn it over to you if that's all right. Sure. Um, so I wanted to then uh, touch on the 2019 uh, topics facilitators that's linked on the agenda there. Um, we are still looking for some facilitators. Um, I think uh, we have uh, folks lined up until uh, June. Um, and then it looks like we need uh, people for June, August, September, November, and December. So we're in need of five um, five folks to help organize. Um, it looks like we have topics for those months. Um, and uh, the facilitator generally um, uh, helps corral some folks who might uh, uh, do it as a panel or give a presentation of some sort or organize some sort of um, uh, discussion of some sort. And then we, we generally just have some community dialogue after that. Um, it's not terribly, terribly involved. It would be for one session. Um, the topics are software toolkit show and tell, international models for collaborative infrastructure, using the cloud for preservation, case studies, apropos for today's discussion, um, advocating for resources, also apropos, um, and scales and economics of digital preservation. I think we could touch on everything today. Um, is there any any of these that anyone uh, is just really excited about and would like to volunteer to uh, organize a topical discussion on? You are all eager and excited, I can tell. Um, well, we can put an email out to the group. Um, and if we don't get any volunteers, um, Corey and I might uh, uh, tap on some virtual shoulders um, and see if we can get some folks involved. Um, we there's probably also some room maybe to squish around some of the topics too. Um, we do have them slated right now for months, but I think those, the um, the timing could change potentially as well. Um, if the if you really wanted to do, for example, uh, scale on economics of digital preservation, but you couldn't do it in December where it's currently slated for, for example, you know, we could switch that to August or whatever. Um, so please do think about that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to bring up um, is I think they were going to talk about this in January when I wasn't able to make the call. Um, Corey, did you guys talk about the um, the new member um, or uh, hmm. liaison? liaison? Yeah, briefly, but but please. Um, Paige, were yeah. you at that um, meeting last month? No, I had to miss last month, but I am slash was the new member liaison for the content into Scoop. So. Uh, um, if that's a parallel position, I could talk a bit about what I do with the content group. Could could you maybe uh, just talk a little bit about that? Um, uh, um, uh, we were Corey and I were thinking um, that might be something good for this group. Um, that role. Uh, yeah. So maybe if you could just speak a little bit about what you do uh, in that other in the other group. Sure. Yeah. Um, the idea sort of rose out of, I guess it was the 2017 DigiPres conference. Um, we had a content working group meeting. I had just joined NDSA um, with Boston College and um, had not really like gotten any sort of on-ramping experience. And I had a lot of questions about NDSA. Um, so then at the content group, I sort of said, oh, well, this would be a great position to have someone who could, you know, answer someone's questions for new members and give them a little bit of background on NDSA. And they sort of said, okay, great. Why don't you do it? <laughs> Which often happens when you, uh, you have an idea. And I said, sure, I, I like talking to people. So um, basically, uh, the new member liaison um, schedules like a once a month meeting for new members, um, like any members that say have joined in January, NDSA, your content group. Um, you can schedule a call with them, give them a few resources to so like working groups and things like that, um, serves to join and answer any questions that they have. Um, and it's been pretty successful because the people who have joined our content group 
um, have stayed pretty um, active and vocal in it. So I, I'm not going to take the credit for it, but I think um, reaching out to them first and being engaged with people helps them um, be able to communicate back and engage better with the group. So that's mostly it. <laughs> okay. Would you just, you know, would you say you'd like this takes an hour a month, maybe? Or if that, less even? Um, if that? NDSA, I think I've had like three calls this whole year, maybe four. Um, so it's, it's pretty low maintenance. So four hours total for the whole year, <laughs> plus a little bit of communication via email. Um, so very low barrier for anyone who wants to do it. And what's the, uh, what's the pay like? <laughs> really <laughs> no, high. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's grant funded. <laughs> the entire IMLS grant for this position. I'm Very totally nice. Um, please don't take that seriously. <laughs> uh, I know we're really fun too. You get to meet new people and, and stuff like that. Oh. Um, I know we're, we're, we're dwindling down in numbers here, but was there anyone on the call um, who might be interested in, in serving in this role for, um, for our group? Um, the infrastructure interest group, it does tend to be one of the more popular uh, interest groups out of the, the three um, standards practice uh, content and infrastructure. Um, NDSA probably gets you know, anywhere between one and four um, new organizations that sign on a month. Um, and I would say usually uh, one or at least one person or two people from those are, are, are interested in joining the infrastructure group. Um, I believe we have, uh, oh, we did have one new person on today. It would have been nice to, to welcome them um, uh, had I gotten there in time and thought about it. Um, would have been nice for, for something for the new, new member or liaison perhaps to welcome people on a call. Um, so we do, we do get people uh, joining um, and maybe something else this person might do um, is to send a welcome email. That's something uh, Corey and, or I do now um, is when they get added into the group um, is we send sort of a, a welcome message um, from the chair um, and maybe that would be another thing that this person uh, could do might be appropriate to or not. I, I'm just thinking out loud here, um, but was anyone interested? A very, uh, very volunteering group today. Uh, we'll put something out uh, on the uh, email list and maybe. Yeah, um, that sounds, sounds good. Okay. All right, is that all then? I think so, yeah. Thanks Nathan for jumping in at the end there. No problem. All right, and then I think uh, we're meeting in March and uh, uh, Art is uh, going to give us uh, an overview from PASIG, which just uh, was a week before last, I believe, in Mexico. Yeah. Uh, he's got lots of really great speakers lined up that were there as well. So it's going to be a great, great call. Good. Excellent. Oh, there's Art. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, everyone, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your Monday. Thanks, Nathan. Bye, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thanks, Scott and Chip, once again. <laughs>